Welcome to Manifold. Today, my guest is Anna Krylov, professor of chemistry at the University of Southern California. She works in the field of theoretical and computational quantum chemistry. Anna was born in Donetsk, Ukraine, graduated from Moscow State University, and received her PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 2021, she wrote a paper called The Peril of Politicizing Science, which launched a national conversation among scientists and the general public on the growing influence of political ideology in science and engineering. It has received over 85,000 views and is the all-time highest ranked article in the Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters. I want to welcome Anna to the program, and I want to emphasize that she is speaking only as an individual person, not on behalf of any organization, specifically not on behalf of the University of Southern California. Anna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure to be there here. It's a pleasure to meet you. When I read your article, I was extremely impressed. One of the things you did was ground the whole conversation in your own experiences growing up in the Soviet Union. And these are experiences which I think most people, Westerners, won't be familiar with because to some extent, they've been spared ideology in their own education, well, to some degree in their own educations. Maybe we could just start with a little bit about your early life and how it is related to the topic of our discussion today. Uh, right. So it was very different, to say the, the least. So quality of life was orders of magnitude below the West. And, you know, most basic things were in short supply. Yeah, we had to stand in endless lines to get basic groceries and like butter, eggs, meat. But that's not most important part. The most important difference, I think, is the omnipresence of ideology, Marxist-Leninist ideology. And we experienced it from very early days in our lives. We didn't just simply live our lives. We were told that we are building a bright future for the whole world, for the entire world. We were to liberate oppressed masses worldwide from the oppressors. And to achieve this goal, we were told we need to destroy the old world. So we were at war with everyone else. It was a cold war, but we were surrounded by our enemies, we were told, by the West, by the evil West who were there, out there to destroy our country and enslave us. So, because of that, everything and everyone was scrutinized through the lens of the alignment with Marxist ideology. Books, children's books, music, chemistry, uh, and you name it. And uh, non-conforming thoughts and actions were punished. So, if you dare to dissent, you could get in trouble, in big trouble. You could get in jail for reading a wrong book. Or you could go get in mental hospital for writing your own book. So I'm not speaking up wasn't enough. So you couldn't just mind your business and keep your head down. You had to enthusiastically engage. From the kindergarten, I remember we had a giant banner in our first grade hanging in the classroom, who is not with us, is against us. And, you know, God helps those who is against us. One had to join communist organizations at pretty junior age. They have a whole set of age-appropriate organizations. And if you do not join them, your prospects in life were severely limited. So I was pretty lucky. I think I was one of the luckiest generations in the whole history of the USSR because uh, the wall came down in 1991 when they were still young. And my generation was able to get out and live our lives in the West and build successful careers. And it kind of scares me to think how my life would have turned if the communist regime lasted for 20 more years. Now, in your essay, you, you ground the discussion in 
the, what you just described, the, it's the ideological environment that you grew up in. When did you start to see things start changing in the West to make you think about the analogy back to Soviet times? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I spent most of my career time as a normal academic, which means working long hours, writing papers, mentoring students, writing grants, and so on. So I wasn't very much aware of what's going on. And I started to notice things about two years ago, when all of a sudden we would, you, know, you wake up and you get your daily serving of Orwellian news, news articles, uh, memos from your university, from professional organizations about things like rem removing names from, uh, well, anything you can think of, words, things, chairs, equations even, and so on, or memos and news about forbidden words about how we should change the way we speak and we should not, you know, use proper words. And more than that, you know, we started to see this Soviet-style, really Soviet-style propaganda articles coming from our major scientific outlets that would communicate such ideas as science is racist, science is Western, science is colonial, and we have to change. We have to change everything. We have to destroy scientific enterprise because it's all corrupt by systemic injustices and build a new one. And the parallels are very clear for someone who experienced this in the Soviet Union. So you could see side by side how these trends resemble what, what we remember from the Soviet Union. So let me, let me quote from your article. You say... I witness ever increasing attempts to subject science and education to ideological control and censorship. Just as in Soviet times, the censorship is being justified by the greater good. Does that, does that capture the, your feelings about the environment at USC? Well, maybe not necessarily at USC, although we do have part of this too. But speaking of censorship, you know, I see now that censorship permeates uh, scientific publishing. It's not just that you cannot express your opinions routinely because you can get mobbed and ostracized publicly for them or even suffer career consequences. I'm as an editor for two journals. I mean, nothing spectacular, just routine chemistry journals publishing chemistry research. And I see how, you know, we received a memo a couple of years, last year for our board for physical chemistry, chemical physics from a publisher. They told us that from now on, we should consider and, pre and prevent publication of harmful content, content that can offend some people. And never thought we will, you know, see things, such things in <laughs> chemistry, but that's spreading pretty rapidly. And I see more of it in the, not just in the Royal Society of Chemistry, but also in United States, in journals managed by professional societies and so on. So I, you know, although I was born and I grew up in the United States, my father had come to the U.S. from China. And the cultural revolution was in full swing when I was a kid. My dad would receive letters from his relatives in China, and he would spend time explaining to me how terrible the events that were occurring in China were. So I, I had a pretty firsthand, or I, not maybe not firsthand, but secondhand understanding of what had gone on there. So in some sense, I feel like I was a little bit sensitized, perhaps as you have been, to movements in this direction. Now, if you talk to your sort of typical American-born leftist colleague and they say, oh, Anna, you're just being overly dramatic. Nothing is really going on. We're just making slight course corrections to improve all kinds of aspects of social injustice in our work environment. What, what would mm -hmm. you say to that person? Yeah, you are very right that for people who saw it before, even maybe not through own eyes, but from close relatives, it's very easy to recognize the symptoms. And I think it's very important to recognize that these liberal regimes like in China, in Russia, in other places in the world, things didn't happen overnight. And these liberal forces started kind of easy 
first. So, and what I would say, I would say, okay, let's look at the specific manifestations of what's going on and let's uh, compare it with other times. Let's look, for example, at this idea that somehow we should teach uh, chemistry or mathematics in a way that it promotes certain social justice ideas. So that's exactly how we were taught uh, in Russia. Everything you know, was supposed to promote the eminence of Marxism-Leninism and, and, you know, numerous benefits of socialist regime. And when you, and if your discipline somehow would not be sufficiently aligned with Marxism-Leninism, it can be cancelled. And there are examples from the Soviet time, you know very well example of Lysenko and the devastating effect it had on biology. So now we see very similar trends permeating biology and medical education in the United States. And even at very basic education, we are told now that we should be teaching like simple biological facts, like, you know, thinks that mammalian sex is pretty binary and well-defined, but instead we should be teaching that there is no such thing as biologically determined sex. Likewise, in the in teaching of physics or chemistry, in some schools, you know, they do not teach any more Newton laws. We say that we should decenter the Western influence and we should call the laws differently. In some places, uh, people say that we should in some medical school, even they say that we should learn more indigenous way of knowing, okay, and not ground education in the in this horrible Western science, and that's so 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 similar to what we saw in the USSR with Lysenko. And what worries me is that consequences would be also very simple. So I do not think these parallels are exaggerated. Now it's true that at this point of time, we still live in a democratic society, so dissenters may be punished, but we are not put in jail, we are not put in psychiatric uh, hospitals. But if things continue to develop in this way, you know, we may end up in this situation. And there are already very troubling examples. For example, a student in a medical school was, was uh, fired removed from the program and recommended to undergo psychiatric treatment because he openly questioned at the mandatory training session the validity of the concept of microaggressions. So the student went to court and won, but the very fact that these things start to happen worried me very much. And I think they illustrate that the parallels with totalitarian regime are not not that exaggerated. They're not hyperbolic. They're real. You know, I, I think this particular incident that you mentioned, I don't think most people who are on the left really realize that many of the concepts like microaggressions or unconscious bias, that they, they actually rest on fairly weak science in the sense that, you know, the studies, the psychology or sociological studies that underlie a lot of these ideas often tend not to replicate. And so even a, a clever undergraduate who has just done some reading on the internet might go into this kind of session and just start asking some reasonable scientific questions about mm -hmm. some of the things that he, he or she is being taught. And, and as you just pointed out, you can get into incredible trouble just by asking those questions. Mm -hmm. But that's the main signature of totalitarian regimes. The first thing they suppress is freedom to ask questions. Yeah, it was the same. It was very similar in Soviet Russia when they weren't allowed you know, even people that were completely loyal to the regime, they weren't allowed to ask questions. If you ask too many questions about history or about, you know, why we do things certain way, that that gets you in trouble. And now we see these ideas coming through the critical social justice, and we have ideologues like D'Angelo or Ibram Kendi that openly say that, you know, if you... If you question the existence of systemic racism, you are racist. That's, that's it. And uh, I think that kind of really very similar. If you if you question the validity of Marxist-Leninist doctrine, some particular instance, you are playing into the hands of reactionary West, and therefore you should be punished. You know, you you mentioned the example of Lysenko, and I, I obviously I think you and I are pretty familiar with that history. But I would 
guess maybe even a decent fraction of my listeners are not very familiar with it. One thing I might say is that the Soviet study of the entire field of genetics, both in terms of agriculture and plant breeding, but also including humans, was completely destroyed by this guy. And I, I would say probably, at least from my understanding, it hasn't that area of science hasn't fully recovered even today in Russia. For a couple of decades, people, you know, it was not possible to publish a paper talking of, about chromosomes. And he stayed in power for like 10 years past the Stalin death, at least. And it was really, truly devastating for the field. Now, what is interesting, like some of, idea, of the ideas that he was promoting a kind of we see them resurfacing today. For example, that, you know, everything is a black slate. You can teach orange trees to grow in Siberia. You can teach, you, know, you can change the wheat and make it grow at cold climate differently and things of that nature. He even believed that, you know, cuckoo, cuckoo chicks become... Um, so they appear because other birds of the diet of other birds. So, but now, you know, we see very similar ideas that, you know, there is no such thing as biologically determined outcomes spreading around at alarming pace. We hear this idea of, you know, clean slate, clean slate humans that you can make anyone to be anything was very very dear to communism. It was central to communist party and we see resurfacing of it here too. For example, in California, I do not know if you follow, there is a proposal to reform mass education K-12. And it has a lot of different things proposed, which are very worrisome. They want to change, remove algebra and uh, calculus and What's not? But one of the things that is proposed is to do away with programs for gifted children and to keep everyone in public school in the same classroom till 11th grade. And the justification for it comes because they say, well, first of all, you know, these programs are racist because demographics in these programs doesn't reflect demographics of the state. And point number two, the proponents of this uh, uh, changes are making. They say there is no such thing. They say we reject the idea of natural talent and gift. And so they say gifted children do not exist. Everyone is the same. Therefore, we should not create special programs for children that study mathematics at advanced level. So that's very similar to how communist ideologues saw the people. No one is irreplaceable. Everyone is equal. And it's up to Communist Party to turn people into what they want them to be. I, I think ordinary Americans, you know, would, would be surprised by a policy like that because most people, when they went through school, could see some children were more talented than others, say, at learning science or something. But, and, and I think, you know, when, when parents encounter this kind of thing at their school, they just shake their heads and they say, okay, my God, my, our school board is really mismanaging the education of my children. But the thing, the step that I think most Americans don't take is they don't realize that sometimes the origin of these policies is really highly ideological and it, it originates in the writings of somebody like Ibram Kendi. And that, that connection, I think, is kind of hidden from most people. Mm -hmm. That's true. And if you try to explain to people some policies like at universities or in school, when we hear all these, you know, policies of diversity, equity, and inclusion, about equity, equity of outcomes, and anti-racist pedagogy, and you're explaining to people that, look, you know, it's coming from a critical social justice perspective. It's, you know, slightly dusted over Marxism, Leninism, just repackaged for modern consumption. People say, no, no, that's not true, you know. Like, I never heard of this, and, you know, I'm part of DI committee or administration, and I never heard of these ideas. And uh, that's deceptive because you do not need to be schooled in these ideas to be implementing them. If system is set up in a way that it promotes these ideas, you can be blissfully unaware of their philosophical origins and still be very effective uh, in promoting them, propagating them. So I think it is important for to explain to people and I hope that more people on STEM will educate themselves and will realize what is 
the reason for all these sudden changes in policies, changes in how things are done in science. So they are not just random. They are not coming through activism. They are coming from very specific epistemic domain. And that's, I think, very important to to appreciate. I, I think you said that very well. And uh, if I could just rephrase a little bit, you know, most of my colleagues who are happily trying to implement and support some of these DEI efforts, I think they really are unaware of what the true origin of this whole movement is. And I think, you know, if I'm being charitable to them, I would just say their attitude is something like, well, diversity is a, a good goal. I would really like to see more underrepresented minority students in my classes and in my profession. And therefore, I should just support all these efforts. And, and anybody who anybody who opposes these efforts is probably secretly a racist. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's how I think many, most people get fooled by these nice sounding words and how, how this ideology is spread because it presents itself in a very nice sounding way saying, okay, don't we all want to make our society, make our universities more just, more equitable, more welcoming? So this is all great. And, but the question is, how do we, how are we going to achieve it and to come to a specific implementation? That's where it's important to stop being fooled by nice sounding words, but look at what is exactly is happening, what exactly is implemented. If you look at some practices that are pushed under the DI umbrella, they are very far from, you know, what they <laughs> purport to do. We talk about diversity, right? So and diversity is a great thing. Diversity of opinions, diversity of cultures. So I'm all in favor for it. But the standard implementation in American university now is that diversity is understood as a lack of diversity, actually. It's understood as, you know, treating people by their race or gender and categorizing people by their oppression points, how much they are oppressed as a representative of a particular group. And as part of this, this policy result in the discrimination of other groups, people from other groups. And that is not what what a regular person would think about what diversity is supposed to mean. You know, one of the things that, outrages me the most is that on other topics, when I speak to my colleagues, if we say have a department meeting or some administrators who are scientists are meeting, usually the conversation is held at a pretty high level. You can be skeptical, you can demand data, you know, you can demand <laughs> rigorous arguments. But as soon as we get into this regime, you can't ask for anything. You know, if you say, well, if we admit students who are not so well prepared into this major, what happens to them? Do they graduate? Mm -hmm. You know, are they prepared? Is it bad for them ultimately to admit them to USC mm -hmm. instead of Cal State Los Angeles? And the people who ask those questions now are more or less labeled as racists for just asking those questions. Yeah, that's, and yeah, more than that, this data being hidden by universities. And I heard recently, I think, California Board of Education, they started hiding the data about racial constitution of students taking advanced placement classes, I think because they didn't like the statistics that they saw. And, and people are afraid to ask for good reason, because they know that they will be labeled racist and no one doesn't want to be called a racist. And people are afraid because they saw examples of public ostracism and uh, and that's horrible because you know if you really want if you are if you are serious about problems of inequalities of social injustices and want to solve them for real we need to discuss them we need to look at the data we need to talk at earnest about effectiveness of different interventions and consequences of different measures and now we cannot do it because these topics became nearly forbidden topics, taboo topics. Yeah, you know, the, the, the degradation of the level of discourse is extremely strong. So in every other area, you and I would be allowed by our colleagues to 
you know, if, if our colleague made an argument, even if the conclusion is correct, if one of the steps in the argument was not fully rigorous or sound, we could question even that step, even if the final result was correct. In this case, they pushed it all the way down to not just using non-rigorous arguments, not just removing data from the argument, but actually penalizing you from even any kind of disagreement with them. So, so it's multiple, multiple levels of degeneration of the level of analysis. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, very well said. <laughs> it, it Unfortunately. Just, yeah, it just drives me crazy. I'll tell you a funny story from when I was the vice president of research here at Michigan State. At one point, I was at a meeting with the president, the provost, and all the senior leaders, the vice presidents at the university. Maybe some deans were there as well. And we were discussing, there were two items on the agenda. One was one of my items, which was I was leading an effort to try to create a kind of scalable coding experience so that even if you weren't in a quantitative major at Michigan State, say you were an art major, if you were curious about learning a little bit more about how computers work and you just wanted to have some very elementary lessons in how to write a short program and make it work, that we would offer some kind of one credit you know, mini course like that so that any, we could say any student who graduated from Michigan State had the opportunity to at least learn a little bit about how an, what an algorithm is or how to write a little bit of code or something. And at the very same meeting where I and the engineering dean were discussing how we were going to try to implement this kind of ambitious university-wide program, the other item on the agenda was removing Algebra 2 as a math requirement for graduation. So up until that time, to graduate from Michigan State University, you had to demonstrate mastery of algebra too, which, you know, for someone, for someone who went through the Russian education system, this would be like something you learned, like when you were 10 or 12 or something, <laughs> but, but that was like kind of one of the last vestiges of rigor in our curriculum was that if you couldn't score above a certain level on the SAT or ACT, then you had to take a kind of basic math course and at least pass it, pass it so that we could be confident that you understood algebra two. And it was explained to us by the DEI people and the provost that we were eliminating this requirement because they had done some very sophisticated data analysis and found this is an extremely difficult bottleneck, which was preventing a lot of underrepresented minority students from graduating from the university. And I could not believe that we had this meeting where I and the engineering dean were trying to roll out this coding opportunity for everybody. And meanwhile, this other group was eliminating the Algebra 2 requirement for graduation. It was, it was like being, you know, in some kind of surrealist yeah. know, kind of play. But that, that was a real thing that happened uh, maybe five years ago at this university. It's very common sentiment. We hear it, you know, okay, school education masses repeatedly described as racist. And this idea that it creates bottleneck for people to enter to higher level is deemed as, you know, a sign of oppression and ill intent. So mass programs are criticized. Now, there are signs of this coming to chemistry, unfortunately. Now, a few weeks ago, there was a case which you might have heard about professor at New York University. His contract was not renewed. He was a junk faculty. So professor of organic chemistry. Now, I teach chemistry too, not organic, but general chemistry. And it's a difficult class. Uh, it uh, weeds out a number of people who cannot get through the, this filter and learn uh, the way of quantitative thinking, uh, the way to apply very important basic chemistry concepts to problems, and some of them do not make it. And I think it's an important uh, step to uh, prepare students for a career in medical. We have a lot of students interested in health professionals and so on. So now this professor was teaching organic chemistry and students complained that uh, grading is too tough and their grades do not reflect the effort they put in the class and that they were not tested on what they know and things like that, which is, you know, it's a usual thing that students always complain. What is unusual in this case is that professor was, you know, the administration just let him go, even though he was very experienced teaching teacher who won numerous awards, he wasn't just incompetent teacher. Now, what is shocking, so in this case, the university acted just because Students complained, and that was it. Now, immediately after that, a science magazine uh, 
uh, Holden Torp, the chief editor of Science Magazine, published the editorial. He publishes editorials regularly where he develops, where he promotes these concepts of systemic racism and things like that. So he wrote an editorial where he went uh, talking about how the whole, you know, educational system is wrong because classes are selecting students into better performing and less performing students, and that's wrong. And then he asked a question, why do we need organic chemistry as a prerequisite for medical school anyway? And so basically, to me, it sounded like a preparation for, you know, ideological pogrom in chemistry education. So I'm... <laughs> I, I have, I'm very thankful about it. I have to say the the writers at Science Magazine are as hard left as any you could encounter. You know, you could go to the World Marxist Leninist webpage, and it seems to me the writers at Science Magazine are would feel perfectly at home there. I, I'm yeah, I'm yeah. very shocked. <laughs> I'm very shocked that this guy doesn't receive some pushback for at least at least I would guess half the scientists who have a subscription to Science magazine disagree violently with that editorial or maybe i'm just too old and i'm out of out of touch but but certainly many people yeah. disagree with what he wrote. many people disagree but you know he keeps publishing this and he is not the only one so nature actually seems like they're in competition who will publish more critical social justice type of material there was recently i think they wrote out nature series on racism in science and a series of editorials and papers and you should look at them they're quite <laughs> quite something and unfortunately so that's i think of it as a, an example of a capture of an institution by by this ideology and i see it throughout i see it throughout i see it in a publishing business Broadly, so it's not just science or nature. We see elements of it in ACS journals, elements of it in the Royal Society of Chemistry, with whom I work. Now, recently I was renewing my contract for Wiley, where I'm serving as an editor for another journal. So I'm getting this draft of the contract, which I usually just, you know, the usual things they tell that you shouldn't, you should do. Your due diligence, you should not engage in anything which is ethically questionable and so on. So all kind of legal sounding stuff. All of a sudden, one page talks about how the publisher is dedicated to the causes, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they want me to sign that as an editor, I will be promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in selecting invited authors for reviews and executing peer review process that I should look at diversity of reviewers and so on. Now, it turns out none of the science editors, including the chief editor of this journal, had no idea about this change. So it came slightly from the top, from the bureaucracy. And, you know, in this case, I thought, I said, I'm not signing it. It's not a part of an editorial process to deal with the diversity and promote it or you know, do anything with it. I'm willing to execute peer review process and to do due diligence editorial work, but not promoting diversity. And in this case, I won. I pushed back and they removed it. But the things keep coming with uh, like avalanche uh, from everywhere. And, uh, you know... <laughs> Practically every organization out there is pushing on its constituents, on the committees, of organizers, these critical social justice grounded policies. And it's very hard to fight back, even though I think it's fair to say that the majority of people, majority of people are against them. Well, I hope you're right. I, I, I feel... You know, I feel that a majority of scientists should be against many of these things, but I'm I'm not sure. You know, I always wonder whether I'm just out of touch and uh, I'm in the small minority of old people who you know just aren't getting with the times. Well, there are numeric data that uh, prove the majority of Americans are against these policies. For example, affirmative action, race-based admissions and race-based decisions was defeated recently in California with pretty big margin. And California is as uh, Democrat and as leftist and as diverse as you can imagine. 
So people see correctly that these policies are not fair. And so you know, I would say this type of policies, critical social justice-based policies, they are, in my opinion, wrong on a moral level because they cause discrimination and because they are anti-humanistic, they treat people as representatives of particular groups, but they're also ineffective because if we stop doing our business by using merit, you know, it's over. If we start publishing papers not based on the quality of arguments and findings, but on the basis of gender and race of the authors, you know, where it will take us. Yes, I you know, I, sh- I, I, I should have said that I think even among faculty, that at least the polling of, uh, you know, all but maybe the youngest faculty, I would guess uh, a pretty strong minority or maybe even majority are opposed to a lot of these things. So I, I think the polling does show that. Surveys do show that. But it, it does seem sometimes like uh, the, the other side has already won. And it's uh, almost impossible. Yeah, because they are very loud. They are very loud, unfortunately. And unfortunately, now it's not just activism that promotes this idea. I think one big loss for common sense and for you know, for normal people is that we somehow missed this point when these diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies took hold of our institutions and universities. And now they embed it everywhere. Every professional society has these committees of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Universities, that's multi-million business with many administrators. And they're empowered. They're empowered to interfere with normal processes. They're empowered to, you know, interfere with faculty hiring, with the way we teach, with the way we run conferences, and so on. So that's, unfortunately, a pretty difficult situation because now we need to fight not only against a small number of loud activists, but also against this big machine supported by serious budget. I think I heard you say in another interview that UC Berkeley is spending $25 million a year Oh, that's wrong. Oh. It was two years ago. Now their budget is $41 million. Per year, that's the last year budget, 41 million per year for UC Berkeley for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in this 41 million, so, you know, people, some people, you know, when I mention this to people who are supporting DI, they would say, oh, but maybe this money going to underrepresented students, and that's okay. That's not true, however, because if you look at their website, it's, uh, you know, information is not, which is not secret, and they proudly announce it. 65% of these 41 millions is going into administrative salaries. So they pay bureaucrats, you know, all kind of deans, vice, vice the chief diversity officers, and so on. So that's type of uh, budgets they are talking about. Yeah, you know, if they were spending that 40 million on hiring tutors for underrepresented minority students, you know, who had been admitted, say, through affirmative action, then to me, that would seem reasonable. Mm -hmm. But just to spend it on bureaucrats seems like an incredible waste of money. On bureaucrats, that would create all these, you know, mandatory trainings, this compile lists of forbidden words and, you know, do things of that nature. You know, I, I have been involved with in the science and engineering program at USC for many years. And one big barrier for women, but I assume it also probably would apply to other underrepresented groups, is uh, how to combine effectively your family obligations with uh, your professional life. And we have been trying very hard to lobby university to invest into childcare program to make it easier for people with families and kids to to go with their lives. Now, if you put 41 million for child care, that would help a lot of a lot of people, women and people from poor backgrounds who do not have resources to pay for private child care and so on. So that would do a lot of good things. But no, that doesn't, you know, that's not what they are doing. They are putting millions into administrative salaries and bureaucracies. 
And unfortunately, I think, I don't know who said this, maybe Milton Friedman or somebody, <laughs> that basically once you create a bureaucracy like that, it's the hardest thing to get rid of. They'll, they'll fight for their own, even if their cause goes away, they'll fight for their own continuation. Yeah. If you imagine just, you know, what would happen if, you know, that assumes that we do have a you know, problem of diversity and systemic vision that. So we established this institution. You have a lot of people whose profession is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Let's say we look in two years, three years, five years, and, you know, we see that problem is solved. We have perfect equity. Our Faculty and student body represents demographic of the state perfectly. No one is complaining about any harassment or anything. So what do we do? I mean, they will not go away, right? So they will fight very hard to to pretend that we still have problems even if we do not have them. And we see this happening because a lot of narrative about horrible oppression and, you know, friendly climate is coming, is promulgated by these bodies of people. Yeah, I think for that group of people, a racist incident on campus is quite good for them because it gives them something to talk about and to, to motivate their side. Yeah, and they are very reluctant to speak up when, for example, incidents like hate crimes on campus turn out to be hoaxes. And I talked to my friends from other schools we didn't have many of this at UC, not at all probably, but I heard uh, from other schools where this hate crime incidents often are hoaxes and university officials and university you know, outlets are very reluctant to publicize it. They would publicize hate crime and you know, will use it as, as a need to institute new policies, but when it comes to light that it, it didn't happen, they would just quietly, you know, let it go. Yes. So I think we've, we've done a pretty good job of outlining what the problem is. Now, you were kind enough to share with me a new article that you've written with a collaborator, Jay Tansman. This article is called mm -hmm. Fighting the Good Fight in an Age of Unreason, a New <laughs> Dissident Guide, which I, I love your title and I, I love the content of your paper. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I should start with a joke, with a Russian joke, you know, like the, it's, it's what is the difference between a Jewish optimist and Jewish pessimist? And the Jewish the pessimist says that things are so bad, they cannot get any worse. Now, an optimist says, no, 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 they surely can. <laughs> so I think... I keep thinking about this, you know, all the time, because on one hand, the situation here is really bad. I think in campuses have we lost a lot of ground with the establishment of the AI, this infiltration of this ideology and ideologues into our professional societies. But I think things can get much worse if we do not fight back. So I think it's important to push back. And it's important to do it sooner than later, because the more ground they get, the more difficult it is to unseat them and to push back. And I recently read a book called Counter Warcraft by anonymous professor in STEM. It's a very short book, it's barely 100 pages long, but it's very well written and it explains very well in very compact way the ideological basis of this critical social justice explains with concrete examples what happens in universities and offer some number of ways to resist. And what I liked about this book is that some means of resistance, they are very low risk for people. So you do not need to become, you know, public martyr for free speech and for anti-DI activities. You can do your job doing some small but important things. So, and uh, what uh, I wanted to emphasize is there are a lot of things we can do within our existing uh, institutions. You know, we can uh, organize uh, letters to administration and uh, to newspapers maybe and push back against uh, discriminatory practices. I learned from Dorian Abbott, for example, that in the University of Chicago, uh, they have a faculty group called U Chicago Free. And they succeeded to make departments 
that posted political statements that violate institutional neutrality, they made them to remove it through acting through the existing governance structures at university. So they also managed to, through Title IX actually, no less, discontinue several programs, seven programs specifically, that were established in a discriminatory way, programs that would give preferences to specific races or sexes in violation of federal regulations. So they succeeded to do that. So another example that I love is at the University of Washington, their administration wanted to push, they put a proposal to require mandatory DI statements, not only for hiring candidates, but also for tenure and promotion. And it's already happening in other schools. So you have to put, you know, not only your scientific impact, but also what did you do for diversity. And faculty protested, and uh, there was an email campaign initiated by a single faculty member, and then faculty voted against and defeated the proposal. So we can do something, but we need to act. You know, I, at, at Michigan State, there is an effort to actually require, the, the promotion rubric used to be teaching research and service or actually research teaching and service, I guess, in kind of order of importance. Mm. And now they're proposing to add separately diversity, equity, and, and inclusion in each of those categories. So you end up with a three by three matrix of, oh. of things and you have to be satisfactory in each of those elements of the matrix. And so we can't even get a clear statement for what is the difference between working for diversity or working for equity in the research context versus the teaching context versus the service. It's, it's incredible change in our promotion system. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, if it passes, it's really dangerous precedent, but unfortunately, you know, we see examples in other schools when that's already happening. And yes. that's, you know, undermining merit and introducing this work, non, you know, work politically charged criteria. And that doesn't, it's not a good news for universities. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're very, the people here that are thinking about resisting it, you know, have commented that by making it so ambiguous, I mean, it's, I don't think they deliberately made, maybe they did deliberately make it, but it's quite ambiguous. You, it's hard to tell whether you've succeeded in all of the entries of that three by three matrix. Mm -hmm. And by making it ambiguous, it just makes it easier and easier for the administrators to promote the people they like and deny the people they don't. That's absolutely correct. And that's the problem that I also have with funding agencies. You know, like NSF for a long time, long time ago, in, introduced this uh, broader impact statements. And uh, at the time, I didn't see the danger of it. And I thought it's not a bad idea. Why shouldn't we explain how our research benefits society at large, but because it's work and because it's not really, you know, well-defined, it can be used to manipulate the outcome because, you know, as much as people disagree about merit, scientific merit of the ideas, as much as, you know, people have their preferences, overall things kind of settle and cream rises to the top. Good things eventually getting recognized and move up. But with this uh, vagueness, with this undefined statements, criteria that uh, empowers uh, bureaucracies to do what they want to do. Because you can always say, oh, you know, you brought, impact is not broad enough, or your diversity, your contribution to diversity, equity, and inclusion is not as good as contribution to diversity, equity, of inc and inclusion of candidate B, and so on. So that's that's a real danger of these things. Yeah, probably you know that the Department of Energy is also introducing this now. Oh, it's so depressing because Department of Energy is our major funder for chemistry, for physics, and for some other areas. And, I mean, it's a very important agency charged with promoting fundamental research they are ultimately related to central, central, central issues for our society, like energy independence, climate change, and so on. And now, yes, so they introduced requirements that each proposal should include a plan to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if you think about it, okay, so here, you know, there is a young person 
coming with a brilliant idea how to solve energy problem. And you, you said, no, 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 not that fast. You know, tell us first how you're going to promote diversity, promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think it's real. And yeah, they made this criteria explicit. Now, Steve, unfortunately, it's not just that. As I learned in another context, Department of Energy, they now introduced also additional policies that are related to conference organizing. And they have, you know, they can support conference organizers, give money for to pay some expenses, to rent a venue, to support graduate students. Now, if you want to get support from DOE, your conference should have a set of policies of misconduct and harassment with uh, ways to report. And, and it seems very prescriptive and very overstepping for me. So that's, you know, another example from DOE, which unfortunately set in motion very unhealthy dynamics in many communities. I heard recently was involved with in one group that organizes conferences and people were talking how we should now put some code of conduct to comply with DOE. And I think it, it's pretty unproductive for scientific community to go down this road of kind of policing everyone and have some anonymous reporting lines <laughs> to report real or imaginary violations of this code. And, you know, we see examples of that. I heard from people that in some conferences, people would complain about harassment or not being welcomed. For example, someone would say, yeah, I do not feel welcomed, you know, there is this person, so-and-so, and they do not make an eye contact when they talk to me. So. That type of complaints people are getting because this, this policies encourage this type of mentality and this behaviors, unfortunately. So they are not really solving real problems of harassment, which I do not think of. I wouldn't say they do not exist, but I think they're extremely rare. But they encourage people to go down this road. I, I wanted to mention an idea that I had for a kind of mechanism that might make it easier for people that are hiding their true opinions, self-censoring or mm -hmm. engaging in what some people call preference falsification to nevertheless mm -hmm. influence events. And I thought that if someone were to build a computational system, you know, just an online system that would allow you to register as a, for example, in your case, USC chemistry professor and verify mm -hmm. your identity. But then within the system, you would be anonymous. The only thing that is preserved about you is just that aspect of who you are. But that it would make it easy to make anonymous polls or surveys of the mm -hmm. actual scientists in a field or the actual professors in a particular department or, or university. And then if say 50% of the professors violently disagreed with some DOE you know, proposal, a policy change, they could make it known. Like you could conduct the survey very quickly and say, yes, these are all validated researchers who have been funded by DOE in this field. And look, 80% of them think this change is terrible, but you wouldn't have to identify any of them specifically as individuals. It seems like the technology, you know, the technological base to do this is very simple and it would have a very, I think could have a very strong impact. Um, I, just, I like that. I like that. I heard similar ideas from somewhere else, and I think that would really help because a lot of uh, time, you know, people, most people do not know what their colleagues even are thinking because everyone is afraid to raise their own opinion. And second, it's very hard to communicate uh, these things and come out when, you know, we deal with things like funding agencies because everyone is afraid for their funding and no one wants to speak up and jeopardize their, uh, their research. So, but having a system like that in place, I think it could be very, very valuable. I, th I think, you know, literally one FTE or fractional FTE could run this as long as that person, the one who runs the server is trusted. So if that person mm -hmm. can be trusted to say, okay, Professor X from UCLA has sent me documentation proving that she has been funded by DOE in the Division of Chemistry in the last five years. And so I register her as having that identity, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. Then I allow mm -hmm. 
her to be surveyed. And it just mm-hmm. seems like it's a, it's a decent way to collectively express her opinion without having to stick our necks out too far. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I- that would be great. But also, you know, I do not know if you noticed, but I noticed that there is a growing number of anonymously published articles. People would publish their opinion about university or policy, but under pseudonym. And it uh, tells me that it actually tells how, you know, how, how bad self-censorship had become and how people are concerned. But if uh, there could be some way to help people to communicate what they think without fear of being uh, cancelled and at the same time to have some validation place that you can say, yes, this article written by anonymous professor X, you know, he's actually is a professor in you know, the North American University. That I think would help. Right. And I mean, even, I mean, of course it takes, a, as you know, a certain amount of effort to, to, I mean, your articles are really beautifully written, by the way. It, it takes some effort to do that. Whereas just having a surveying function where you can, mm-hmm. you know, somewhat accurately survey all the STEM professors at USC mm-hmm. all at once, that would be phenomenal because then the provost mm-hmm. and the provost and the president would really be, you know. Not delighted. <laughs> Well, they would hate it. They would hate it, honestly. But 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 they would take it seriously. So if if yeah. if if you could really show that the system works and it really does access mm-hmm. most of mm-hmm. the faculty that fit that classification, and wow, seventy percent of them didn't like that. You know, it could have real teeth. Well, maybe we should you know try to get some independent funding can start this initiative. You know? <laughs> yeah, I should keep working yeah. on it. I worked on it a little bit yeah. a year or two ago, and I, I, I approached a couple of foundations to get funding to build, you know, the system. I, I think, mm-hmm. you know, probably you have graduate students who, you know, could, could be paid to do it in their spare time. So, I, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, anyway, yeah, maybe I'll get back to it and loop you in if I get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, but meanwhile, you know, people should also use uh, existing service, and they know that, you know, universities do send service, professional organizations send some service, and usually they are pretty narrowly set up, but often there is a box at the end when you can put your comments, and they don't know how effective they are, but I think uh, it's better than nothing, and it doesn't take long time, but you can fix them and kind of send the message on the topic which is which you consider to be very important. So I think people should do more of this. I mean, coming back to the example you gave of the professor at NYU who was teaching organic chemistry, and 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 as you know, he actually had a very distinguished career at Princeton before he moved to NYU <laughs> after he retired right. from Princeton. Mm-hmm. So I recall the New York Times ran an article about his contract not being renewed. And you know, the New York Times leans pretty far left. But among the reader comments, they were overwhelmingly in favor of this professor. And actually, there are many Princeton students who had taken this guy's course at Princeton over the years who put their comments there. So in that setting, you know, there were it was very well, of course, it's not a scientific survey. That's the problem. But Mm -hmm. nevertheless, there was strong evidence that what the NYU dean, by the way, I know the NYU dean who did this, by the way, he's a he's a Russian (laughs) theoretical physicist whom I've known for many years. But. Anyway, so he, but th- the evidence is very strong that uh, people didn't like what happened there, but it, it, it's short of having, for example, a survey of NYU STEM faculty saying, hey, we're really against mm-hmm. this. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, no, it's, it's a good idea. I like to hear ideas, actionable ideas, right? That we don't just complain that we do something. And that sounds like a really worthwhile actionable idea to create this capabilities for surveying and to compile these uh, surveys and then, you know, we can use them to approach our universities or funding agencies or professional societies. Yes. Yes. I, anyway, so well, maybe offline we'll connect and, and work on this, but I, 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 I want to be respectful of your time and I see that we've mm-hmm. reached uh, about an hour. So let me ask you just for any final thoughts that you have or any exhortation to our colleagues and the faculty to action and anything you want to say to conclude our discussion. Well, I think we should fight. That's my, my concluding remarks because I think most of us or maybe even all of us, we think strongly about science. We are very passionate about science. We want it to continue to thrive. We know that science is important for society and we want it to continue to 
deliver benefits to everyone, and we should unite our forces and defend science from these uh, illiberal ideologies. Well, very well said. My guest today has been Anna Krylov of the University of Southern California. Anna, thank you very much for this conversation and, and for writing those articles, which I think have moved a lot of people. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Great. 